Gamers, and welcome back. It is us, Dragon's Greed Gaming. I am your host, the Great Unclean One, and also your GM. If you are a new listener, then I welcome you to the show, as we are about to dive into some of the Alien franchise. If you are a returning listener, then welcome back. You've probably been listening to our very first actual play series, Gallows Geist, which was a Warhammer Fantasy uh, RPG series. That has concluded, and we are now about to move on to our next string of episodes. Uh, we are going to be diving into the Alien role-playing game by Free League Publishing. Uh, but before we do that, just a quick introduction. Uh, it's just me today. Uh, if you're new, I am the host. I run things around here, and I was also the GM for our last show. And it looks like I'm going to be the GM for a couple more shows that we have coming up. Uh, but welcome. Um, I have a little bit about me. I have been a gamer of all types for many, many moons. Started when I was a wee lad in grade school, playing video games, board games, and eventually getting into miniature games and role-playing games. Uh, I've been involved with a lot of stuff for Games Workshop for a long time. I worked for them for almost eight years, and I've been really invested in a lot of their universes and series as well. Um, also a big horror movie buff as well, and grew up watching uh, the second film, Aliens, uh, for quite a long time, playing with some of the action figures and toys back in the day from Kenner, and uh, recently getting into some of the novels and uh, comic books as well. Uh, and this is my channel, our channel, we are Dragon's Greed Gaming. Our hope and desire is to make this a channel about all things gaming as we move into the future. Uh, we've been doing this now for close to two years with our first actual play series, which was Gallows Geists. And uh, we've got an alien series about to be coming up here, as you're going to learn. And then we've got some more things in the future, uh, hoping perhaps one day to move to uh, more true video or maybe even streaming or battle report type uh, games and things like that. We'll see where the channel goes and, and how it uh, all develops. In the meantime, uh, that's just a little intro of who we are. So welcome to the show. Just wanted to spend a few minutes today introducing you to the Alien franchise, the Alien RPG, what to expect for the next uh, dozen or so weeks here on the channel uh, before we move into our next podcast. So, as I've said, we are finally moving into the universe of Alien. Now, if you have not heard of the Alien franchise, uh, I would be very surprised, uh, but I suppose there might be some of you out there that are not terribly familiar with it. So, a brief synopsis, uh, the Alien franchise is one of the biggest, oldest, and most well-known uh, sci-fi action slash horror franchises out there uh, starting all the way back in 1979 with the very first film Alien which was directed by Ridley Scott Sir Ridley Scott and starring Sigourney Weaver uh, a role that really brought her to the forefront of film and cinema of which she's received many awards nominations and accolades right, right, rightfully so and also, if you weren't aware, Ian Holm, the actor who played Bilbo Baggins in the original Lord of the Rings trilogy and then reprised that role in the Hobbit series as the older Bilbo, he was actually in the original film as Ash, the uh, science officer of the ship. Uh, and that was followed up in 1986 with the sequel Aliens, directed by James Cameron. Sigourney Weaver returned to reprise her role as Lieutenant Ellen Ripley. And the franchise has gone on with many more films since, uh, following with the troubled but hidden gem Alien 3 and the controversial Alien Resurrection. There's also been some crossovers of Alien vs. Predator, although that's not really considered canon in the true Alien uh, continuity. And then Ridley Scott came back to do a prequel series, uh, starting with Prometheus, followed by Alien Covenant. Uh, a lot of mixed emotions on those. 
I personally think they're awesome films, and if you have not seen them, check them out. If you have seen them and weren't a fan, I encourage you to go back and watch them. I was not very excited when I first saw Prometheus in the theater, but having gone back now, seen what he's done and tried to do, I can really appreciate those films. Uh, unfortunately, those were meant to tie in and kind of be a prequel to lead up to how Alien all started. Uh, there were a lot of stories and perhaps it was going to be a trilogy, uh, but for various reasons, after Alien Covenant released, Fox did not move forward with a third film, although there was uh, an Alien Awakening film in the works, supposedly. There was also the infamous uh, Neil Blumkampf, Alien 5, uh, the director of um, District 9 and, and some other great films. None of those projects came to light, and it's kind of lingered ever since Covenant came out. Uh, however, with the acquisition of Fox by Disney, there has been new life, hopefully, into the Alien franchise. There's a TV series coming out and supposedly another film, although um, details are kind of sketchy at best. But they seem to be confirmed at least, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, if you want other Alien uh, content, there's tons of novels and tons of comic books, all the way back in the 80s with Dark Horse Comics. They even uh, continued the continuity of Aliens before uh, Alien 3 was released. Um, so at the time, that was, I guess, considered the canon. Um, there's also tons of video games, some not so great, others uh, such as Alien Isolation, uh, not only exactly what an Alien game should be, but fantastic video games in their own right. Uh, the recent uh, Aliens Fireteam Elite, pretty cool as well. And the infamous Alien Marine, um, Colonial Marines, perhaps doomed from the start. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of Alien content out there if you want to get on it. And what, what exactly is Alien? Well, I'm glad you asked. So uh, again, if you know about this stuff, feel free to skip ahead or listen to me ramble for a bit. Um, but if you're new to the Alien franchise, uh, or aren't very familiar with it, it's worth knowing because not only is it this massive franchise that's very well known, but it is also uh, a big deal just in pulp, pop culture in general. A lot of things that Alien tried set the bar, and uh, the first two films pretty much universally are considered some of the best sci-fi horror and action films out there. Uh, the first film, Alien, was definitely a horror film. Uh, the creature's only on screen for a couple minutes total in like an hour and a half, two hour film. And I don't even think it shows up before the first 40, 50 minutes of the movie. Uh, very well done with a really cool look into the future from the eyes of just regular blue collar working people. And then in the sequel, Aliens, we get into more action sci-fi uh, with gunfights and uh, soldiers and things of that nature, and more than one alien, as the title would suggest. Uh, but basically, Alien is the story of Lieutenant Ellen Ripley, who is on board a ship called the Nostromo, a freighter-type ship, and uh, that ship receives, they pick up a distress call, go investigate a strange unknown moon, and as you can imagine, things go terrible from there. And the first four films, uh, being Alien, Aliens, Alien 3, and Alien Resurrection, are all um, Lieutenant Ripley's story as she deals with these horrible creatures and uh, the evil corporation, Weyland yutani is always trying to get their hands on samples to weaponize them and do all other sorts of nasty experiments. Uh, the prequel films delve more into the idea of synthetics and androids. Synthetic life is a big part of the alien universe, and uh, themes about where do we come from, who made us, why were we made, what's our purpose, what's our place in the world and the universe, uh, are prevalent throughout all the films, but especially in the prequel films. And uh, that's where we are introduced to the android character David, played by Michael Fassbender, uh, an excellent, excellent character, and we're introduced to uh, an alien species called the Engineers, uh, supposedly creatures that created humanity and perhaps had something to do with the creation of the xenomorph from the films, uh, and the introduction of the, uh, the black goo, the pathogen. And um, Naomi uh, Rapace 
Uh, she plays one of the main characters in Prometheus. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of cool stuff in there as well. I recommend you check it out. So ultimately what Alien is about, it's sci-fi, it's horror, it's action, it's wonder, exploration, and this kind of fear of the unknown. And that's where we're going to kind of jump into the Alien role-playing game. So if you can't already tell... I am a big fan of the Alien franchise. I'm not the biggest. I know there's people out there that have a more encyclopedic knowledge of it than, than myself. But having grown up watching uh, Aliens and eventually learning that was only the second movie, I had no idea back when I was, whatever, 8, 10 years old that there was more than one film. Uh, learning there was something before and after that, of course, blew my mind. And it's always been something I've come back to. And over recent years, especially with the RPG coming out, I've really gotten more back into it. So the Alien role-playing game is published by Free League Publishing, Freya Lagan. They are a Swedish role-playing company, a game company that has made lots of awesome stuff. And a kind of sure engine, uh, they call it the Year Zero engine, which is what they base the majority of their rules on for their games and Alien is no exception. The RPG's been out for about maybe two to four years at this point. Uh, I think it was announced just bef just the end of the year before COVID really started. Um, that's when it started getting released towards the end of the year, beginning of the following year, and uh, it's awesome. Um, it is a fantastic game. I'm going to dive a little bit into that today. So, again, if you're new... Uh, you might be wondering, what in the world is a role-playing game? If you're not from that kind of gaming spectrum, that's totally cool. Let me tell you a bit about that. So, uh, role-playing games, quite simply, are uh, games where generally, at least before the days of COVID, uh, you'd gather around a table with a couple friends, everybody would be controlling a character, and generally one person takes on the role of the game master, or the master, the game mother, the storyteller, uh, the narrator. Narrator, whatever whatever game you're playing, they might have a term. Which is the universal term. The GM games master, is the player that basically runs the game. They will present a story to the other players who are each controlling their own character, often referred to as a player character, a PC, and they introduce a story, problems, scenes, uh, other characters for them to interact with. And the PCs, the players, will tell the GM how they want to interact, what their character does, what they say. And most of these games will use dice to determine the outcome of a lot of those things, especially if it's something that's not uh, set in stone. Combat is a big one. Um, maybe try to somebody, maybe intimidate somebody, threaten them, things like that. So it's an unforeseen uh, outcome. Dice will determine your probability of success. And the Alien RPG is different. Uh, we have a GM, which is a game mother, uh, after the other computer systems that are prevalent in the Alien universe system that you base on ship. And the GM, much like in other RPGs, presents a story or an adventure to the PCs, and they have to navigate through that. Uh, where the different is, is much more about horror, and it is much more of a dangerous game than some other RPGs. If you liked the danger of Warhammer Fantasy, or you like the insanity mechanics of Call of Cthulhu, you like dark, grim, gritty, bloody games that have a high probability of death or character mauling, uh, this is a game for you. Um, it captures the feeling, particularly of the first film, Alien, very, very well. Um, this game is all about being up against the unknown and just being a person out in the cold terror of space and how you react with that. So I want to talk a little bit about the mechanics of the game and what makes Alien unique and give you guys a, a framework here so when we're playing you'll understand what the heck we're doing. So uh, Alien is not only a fantastic game because, well, it's alien, 
It's also really good because it is incredibly, incredibly simple. This is a game that does not have a ton of rules. I mean, it has a nice big rule book, but it's chock full of lore and uh, game aids for the games master and just lots of cool information. The core mechanics of the game are very simple, and if you guys have listened to our previous uh, show of Gallows Geist with Warhammer, it is the opposite side of the spectrum of complexity. Whereas I would give Warhammer RPG a 4 or 5 on the complexity scale, I would give Alien probably a 1 or a 2, depending on your, your preference here. So, well, how does it work? So, very simply, um, like in most RPGs, you will have a character sheet for your character. And like most RPGs, you have things like your stats, which in this game are referred to as attributes. You have skills and you have talents. Uh, skills being uh, applicable abilities that you roll dice for to determine your success or likelihood of doing something. And talents being innate abilities that your character has. You don't have many of them, but they make you a little bit more special, a little bit more unique. And it's what really differentiates you from other characters. So you have four attributes. You have strength, agility, wits, and empathy. And those are going to be rated on a scale generally between two to five. Um, it is possible to go beyond five, especially if you are an android character, which we'll get to in a minute. But generally, when you start as a character, you will start between uh, two and five. Um, I guess before I get into that, we should talk about the, the modes of play. So alien presents itself with two distinct ways to play the game, one being called cinematic mode and the other being called campaign play. Campaign play is typical of any other RPG. This is where you and your group would be playing through an ongoing story that might go on for weeks, months, or if you're used to our campaign, Gallows Geist, uh, even years. And the idea is that you are playing characters on a regular basis, whether it's weekly, monthly, bi-weekly, however often you and your friends meet. Uh, but you come back with the same characters over and over in a recurring story that stretches out over time. And you see your characters grow and develop or possibly get killed off and new characters brought in. Uh, Alien does have a system to advance your characters uh, like in any other RPG. It is rather basic. Basically, it's either improving your attributes or your skills or learning new talents. Um, you know, XP is done. Okay, you get an XP for this, XP for that. So very simple and very straightforward. Uh, however, where Alien is different from other RPGs is it has another game mode called Cinematic Play. And I think this is where the game really shines. So Cinematic Play is where you're playing just a one-shot, a single-session adventure, or a shorter adventure that's only going to last a couple episodes, or a couple sessions, and it's, uh, it's broken into acts. Um... All of the published merit material thus far, aside from uh, the Colonial Campaign, the Colonial Marines Campaign, is considered cinematic play. And this is meant to put you right in the action of the movie where it's at its highest point or uh, at the top of the buildup and things are about to get dangerous. They have a couple one-shots that are meant to be played in one session and this is where you have pre-generated characters and you're thrown right into the story and things uh, get crazy pretty quickly. These typically have a high character death count in most situations. Uh, it's not meant for everyone to survive, and it's meant to capture the dread, the horror, and the hopelessness of the films, especially the first one. Uh, often, pretty much always, there are backup characters should a player get killed, and they can control another character later on. So unlike other games that have elimination, let's say uh, everyone's favorite board game, Risk, uh, once you're eliminated, you're pretty much out. In the Alien RPG, it is encouraged, and often in the published material, it is there, it's already in there, that if somebody gets eliminated, if their character gets killed off, there's a replacement for them to take over. Now, they might not have a character right up to the very end, because eventually people are going to get killed off, and your, your cast character is going to be down to the last few survivors, but when done properly, or done... Uh, run by a games master who has an idea or a good pacing ability, uh, it works out really well, and you can easily bring in other supporting cast as things go on. 
Uh, and again, it reinforces how dangerous the aliens and the creatures in this universe are, and that you're just a person, you're just a human. Some of the other cinematic plays are a couple sessions. Chariot of the Gods was the first one they released, uh, a multi-part that's broken into three acts. And again, depending on the speed of your group and just your GM style and things like that, that might last a couple sessions or it might go on a little bit longer. Uh, maybe one session per act or maybe a little bit longer depending on uh, how your, uh, your players play. Uh, but the same idea is you've got a story that's very condensed, it builds up, and there's generally uh, a high body count. So with that in mind, you, you have one of those types of play, and I recommend all the published stuff that Free League's put out so far. I've played through everything except Heart of Darkness at this point. Uh, I haven't played through the Colonial Campaign, but I have listened to a couple actual plays about it. But I've run and played all the other stuff, and it is fantastic. If you like the Alien franchise, you're going to love this game. If you want to try something different or you're into horror, I highly recommend you give it a shot, too. So back to our character sheets. We have our attributes, our stats. We have strength, wits, agility, and empathy. And they're pretty straightforward. Strength is your physical brawn. Uh, it's also important to note strength is your hit points in this game, your health. Uh, so generally, you only are going to have between 2 to 5 health for a character. Hence why the game is so dangerous. Uh, agility is your hand-eye coordination, ranged combat, things like that. Empathy is your charisma, basically, dealing with other characters, social interactions. And wits you can kind of think of as your intelligence stats. Um, you know, skills that require learning, thought process, and things of that nature. Now, if that that's pretty simple right there. We've got four stats, and then we have uh, 12 skills. And there are three skills tied to each attribute in this game. And uh, your skills generally are going to be between a 0 and a 5, at, at least at character creation. And basically, the mechanic of the game is very simple. It's a D6 system, so you're rolling regular six-sided dice. And when you need to make a check of some sort to see if you succeed, generally the GM will tell you to make a, let's say, a stamina check. And you're going to take the amount in your stamina skill and the amount of the attribute that's tied to that, which in this case is strength, you're going to add those two numbers together, and that's your dice pool. So let's say I have a strength of three and a stamina of uh, one. The GM tells me to make a stamina check. I'm going to roll four dice. All you need to do is get one six on one of those dice, and you have succeeded at the test. If you don't get any uh, sixes, then you have failed. So one of two things then will happen. You can either attempt to push the roll and get, get another success, or you can deal with the consequences. Now, if you roll more than one success, uh, I'm sorry, more than one success, multiple sixes, you can use the extras beyond the first as things called stunts. And every skill in the game has uh, a list of different stunts that you can do, but generally these allow you to improve your success in some way. Uh, sometimes it's things like making the task go faster, take a shorter amount of time, uh, you show off, you get bonuses to later skill rolls of similar results, or even if you try to do the exact same thing later, you don't even have to roll. Um, in combat, extra successes can also be used to increase damage, so uh, that becomes very important. So obviously, the more dice you roll, the better chance you have of succeeding, and the better chance you have of rolling extra sixes and doing even cooler stuff. Now, if you fail, just assume that your character failed at whatever they were doing. Now, that might be catastrophic, or that might not be a big deal, um, you'll see in this game, you shouldn't be rolling a lot of dice uh, because of the stress mechanics, so... Uh, if you don't roll any successes or you you roll successes but you want to try to get more, you can do something called pushing your roll. Pushing is very simple. If you push your roll, you gain a point of stress, which we'll get to in a minute, and then you re-roll 
all of the dice that do not have a success on them. It didn't come up as a six. So you have a chance to roll again and try to get some extra successes there. So again, in my example, I've got three strength and one stamina. I roll my four dice, I get one success, I pass, but I decide, you know what? I wanna do better at this for whatever reason. I wanna try to push my luck. So I push my roll, I gain a point of stress. I re-roll those three other dice that came up as less than a six, or in the case of the alien dice, they're just blank and uh, I roll them again. Maybe I get another six so I can have some stunts to do something cool. Now you can use regular D6s. Uh, in this game, sixes are your successes on your, your base dice, which are the ones you roll when you add your attribute and your skill. Um, the Free League ones have a special symbol. looks like a kind of a crosshair on the six, and the rest of the sides are just blank because uh, that's all that matters. But a regular D6 will work too. Now, um, you only can push a roll once, barring some talents in the game. Uh, so your second result, if you decide to push, that stands, regardless of whether you pass or fail. If you pa if you've passed, great. If you failed, well then you just gained a point of stress and you didn't do you didn't advance, you didn't do anything special. So that's on you. Now, where Alien is really unique, and you'll see similarities to other games like Call of Cthulhu and things like that, but Alien has a stress mechanic to represent the building terror and tension in this game and in this universe, trying to emulate what's going on in the movies. So you will have a stress meter. Uh, it's labeled 1 to 10 on your character sheet, but really there's no limit to how high it can go. There are multiple things in the game that will make you increase your stress level. It generally starts at zero at the start of a, a session or a scenario. Uh, as your characters encounter horrible things or dangerous situations or things that scare them or have the potential to freak them out, or by pushing rolls, their stress will start to accumulate throughout the game. Now, stress is both good and bad because stress lets you roll extra dice However, those dice can make you uh, result in what's called a panic roll, which can really mess up your day. So how does it work? Very simple. When you make any sort of roll in the game, you also roll a separate set of D6 dice, generally a different color if you want to roll them all at the same time, uh, and you roll that pool equal to your current stress value. So again, we'll go back to my example. I've got three strength, I've got one stamina, and I have two stress. So in this case, I'm rolling four base dice, or black dice. Uh, that's three for my strength and one for my stamina. And I'm going to roll two yellow dice, or two stress dice, because my stress level is currently at two. Now, stress dice work similar to the base dice if I roll any sixes. Those are extra successes, and I use them in all the regular ways. It's even possible to roll, get no successes on your base dice, but get successes on your stress dice. They work the same way. The idea here is that the adrenaline pumping through your system makes your character focus a little bit more and gives them a little extra edge. However, too much of that adrenaline can be disastrous because if any of your stress dice come up as a one, or in the case of the alien dice, a little face hugger symbol, then your character has panicked. Now, panic generally can be pretty bad, but it depends how stressed out your character is. So if you panic, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna roll a single dice uh, or die, and you're going to add your current stress level. And there is a panic chart in the game that starts between six and 15. The higher you roll on this chart, the worse your character starts to freak out. Um, if you roll a 9 or less in total on the panic table, there's some minor negative effects, but whatever action you were attempting, assuming you rolled any successes, any sixes, still succeeds. However, if you roll a 10 or higher, you are forced to perform some sort of action as your character's fear and flight and fight responses take over. Uh, in that case, you have to do whatever the panic table tells you, and if you had rolled successes on whatever skill you were attempting, you do not do that. It's replaced by your panic result. So managing your stress is absolutely key in Alien. That's a little bit harder uh, said than done, but you want to try to avoid accumulating tons of stress. 
This is also why the game encourages the GM to not have players rolling dice arbitrarily like in some other games. And really, when you roll dice, it should be for something important or exciting or that really advances the story. Uh, because you don't want your characters panicking all the time. And obviously, as you accumulate more stress, the odds of you panicking are worse and worse. So in practice, what I have found is, generally speaking, you, you really don't want your stress to go beyond, like, three or four. At that point, you start to have a pretty good chance to panic. And because you have enough stress there... A moderately n normal or high dice roll will make you panic and you'll start losing your actions. And some of these panic results can result in forcing other characters nearby to take panic tests, gain stress, drop items, get negative uh, modifiers to your stats and things like that temporarily. Um, or do other things like run away, scream, freeze in terror, or even just go completely comatose uh, as you just sit there in absolute terror. So... Very important to keep that in check. Uh, speaking of modifiers, uh, the game is very simple in how the GM can modify or make things easier or simple. Very simply, anything in the game that gives you a bonus or a negative is called a modifier. If it's something that makes it easier, that'll be represented by plus one, two, three, so on and so forth. If it's something that makes the check more difficult, it'll be a negative one, two, three, and so on. And whatever that number is, you either add that many base dice or you subtract that many base dice from your pool. Now, you don't ever subtract panic or stress dice unless you have no base dice left to lose. So let's say in my example again, I've got three strength, one stamina, and two stress. I have a negative uh, modifier of the task. Let's just say it's a difficult task. The GM says, okay, it's going to be minus two. I'm going to take out two of my four black base dice. So now I'm down to two base dice and two stress dice. However, if for some reason I was at negative five, I would lose all four of my base dice and one of my stress dice, leaving me with a single stress dice there. Now, if it gets to the point where you're at zero dice altogether, you can't ever make the roll. I've never seen that happen. Modifiers tend to be between one to three at the most, and you put them together. So if you're suffering from plus two from something else and minus three from something else, in total that's a net of negative one, so you're only losing one uh, one die off your roll. But it's very simple. A uh, very, very simple combat chart for how that works, uh, you know, aiming and things like that, and some other things to really make the game easy for the GM to, um, uh, to guide. Now, aside from all of that, uh, you can play as an Android character as well. If you're familiar with Alien in any way, Androids, synthetics, artificial life are an important part of the franchise, and you can play as an android here as well. Androids work a little bit differently. Uh, the main difference is, first, we need to know if an android is an open android or if they're secret. Uh, if you're familiar with the films, you know that sometimes uh, androids are artificial people and they look identical to humans. However, they are built rather than born, and they are mechanical or biomechanical in nature. They typically have white blood instead of typical red human blood. It looks kind of like a milky substance. And their insides are all sorts of pipes and wires and electronics and tubes and things like that. So if you can get in, if cut, you know, get inside an android, cut one open, you'll know it's an android. But from the outside, they look like a regular person and especially the more advanced models, begin to be able to really mimic uh, human behavior and emotions, so they can be very hard to d differentiate from a, a regular person. There are some synthetics in the Alien universe, like the Working Joes, that are deliberately made so that you know they're an android, but the hidden android is a big part of the, uh, the Alien universe. So in this game, if a android character is hidden, meaning that they're acting as a human, nobody knows that they're an android for whatever reason, then they follow all the normal rules of a human character. They use stress uh, and they deal with all that as normal panic tests and things like that uh, because they're trying to mimic being a human, so they use the human rules. However, if an android becomes known, their cover's blown, or if it's an android that you knew was an android all along, uh, like in Prometheus and Covenant, 
we know right off the bat that David and Walter are androids. They're not hidden, they're not secret, and so the crew and the characters around them are aware of that. So you can have that in Alien as well. If that is the case, um, the android gets to add plus three, um, I believe, to one or two of their stats, um, which is how you can go beyond five. So it is possible to have a, uh, an android running around with eight strength or eight wits, and they just, they'll really dominate stuff there. However, an android, if they're an open android, does not accumulate stress and they don't use panic because they're machines that doesn't affect them. So they can never panic, which makes them very reliable, but they can't gain stress. They can't get extra dice and get bigger dice pools. They can't push rolls, so they can't have like a reroll mechanic like a regular character can. So they're limited to some degree in that. Uh, however, androids typically are a lot harder to kill, uh, which we'll talk about when we get to um, uh, health and damage and things like that. Uh, the last thing with character creation is this game uses... Well, there's two things. The first is your signature item. This is a little trinket your character carries around, and you're able to interact with this once per session or in cinematic play once per act, and it allows you to reduce your stress level by one. And this is, you know, typical things that we've seen with characters throughout literature and, and cinema and things. You know, a character who's got us always smoking on a cigar, or has a lucky coin, or maybe a tattoo or a necklace they got from someone they cared about, or their lucky jacket or hat or something like that. And the idea is that this item gives you a little bit of comfort when you're stressed out. When you have a chance to take a break, you can just kind of play around with that item, whether it's, you know, rubbing the patch on your jacket or saying a prayer over your crucifix or you know, maybe looking at a picture of a family member, and that reduces your stress by one. Looks like I've got a co-host in here right now. I don't know if you can hear. That's my other cat. What's up, buddy? So, uh, that's your, um, your signature items. When you're in-game, it is possible to rest and you can uh, reduce your stress when you're in a safe place. You rest for a couple minutes, reduce your stress every turn. There's a couple talents that can affect how stress and panic works as well, but that's the, the gist basics of it. The last mechanic this game has, or for characters, is the buddies and rival system. So uh, this is pretty prevalent throughout Alien. I don't know if it's really explicitly stated, but uh, just like in, well, in real life, there's people that you like, there's people that you don't like. There might be people that you work with that you get along with really well, and there's other people you really don't care for. And that's what this game has. Uh, at the start of the game, or in cinematic play, this is already determined, you pick one of the other players to be your buddy and another character to be your rival. The idea here uh, is mostly for role-playing purposes. Your buddy is someone you care about, someone you want to help out, and if they're in danger, you might risk your neck to try to save them or have their back. If it's a rival, though, eh, not so much. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to outright attack your rival or leave them to die. But if you have a choice between saving your buddy or your rival, you're going to pick your buddy. Um, you might argue with your rival, you know, it's that person at work that uh, you just don't like their jokes, you don't get along with them. You have to work with them, so you deal with it, you grit your teeth, but they're not your favorite person. You're certainly not going to be going to their birthday party. And so that is, uh, that's what we have here. Sorry, my cat is all over right now. <laughs> okay, there we go. He's, he's face crashing into everything. Okay, cool. Uh, what else? Oh, well, let's talk about combat, because that's, well, that's part of most RPGs, and it's no exception here, although, uh, as you'd imagine, it is dangerous, and you don't want to do it a whole lot. So, throughout the game, you, uh, everything's broken into actions. Very simple. Again, we have two types of actions, fast actions and slow actions. During your turn, you can take one fast and one slow action, or you can not do a fast or a slow action and take two fast actions instead. The game breaks this down with a very handy chart. There's maybe about 10 or 12 actions for fast and slow. Uh, typical things, drawing a weapon, opening a door, running, you know, moving X amount, uh, making an attack, blocking an attack, using a skill, things like that. Now, it is... Uh, Good to note here, 
movement in Alien is done a little bit more theater of the mind rather than a hard, fast grid or a system like feet or things like that. So if you're used to games like D&D where, you know, you move five feet, uh, or every square is five feet and you can move 30 feet per turn or again Warhammer was done in yards this is done with zones and it might be hard for some people to wrap their head around but you really shouldn't sweat it too much basically your map your uh, battlefield whatever it may be generally broken into zones and zones might be big sections of the map small sections of the map whatever it may be but when you move, you'll be able to move a certain number of zones. Uh, and then range is all done by zones as well. So, you know, long, short, medium, engaged, things like that. And so it keeps it very nebulous, which I think helps. I know some players have a hard time wrapping their head around that when it's more theater of the mind. Uh, but it's to try to keep the game simple and not get bogged down with some of that stuff. So... Just something to, to be aware of. Now, when we get to, to combat, of course, that's the, some of the meat here. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You'll make a skill check, generally, if you're trying to attack or be attacked by someone. And in close combat, there's a close combat skill. If you're trying to shoot somebody, then there's a ranged combat skill. Just like with any other skill, you'll roll your corresponding attribute and your corresponding skill. So close combat is based on strength. Um, range combat is based on agility. Add those dice up, make your roll. Now, some weapons will give you a bonus, so they'll give you additional dice when you make your attack, and then they have a base damage. So if you score at least one success, you pass your test, you do the base damage of the attack. If you have stunts, extra sixes, you can use those to add one additional damage per stunt, and you can do other stuff too, like knock opponents down or back or try to pin them if they're a human, um, make them drop a, an item, you know, things like that. So it's pretty straightforward. You know, for example, a, uh, a, a pistol gives you two bonus dice. So you get two dice to your attack. It's pretty easy to use, pretty easy to handle, but it's pretty measly as far as firepower, so it does one base damage. Uh, however, when you're talking about characters that generally only have two to five health, you know, doing one damage can be a big deal. And if you've got enough successes, you know, a single shot, you could potentially... Uh, do three, four damage in a single shot. So it could get pretty uh, pretty brutal. There's armor in the game. Armor's very simple. Uh, you, If you're wearing armor, you, you'll have an armor rating. You roll that many D6s. For every six you roll, you ignore a point of damage. So like marine armor gives you six dice, and uh, you can reduce damage that way. The other way you can reduce damage is you can uh, try to block an attack. Um, it's only for close combat. If you are attacked in close combat, you can give up a fast action to try to block, assuming you have any sort of weapon or item in hand, feasibly. You can use those to uh, make an opposed roll, and uh, if you, uh, for every success you roll, you cancel out one of the attacker's successes, and if you cancel them all out, then the attack is blocked or it misses. If nothing else, it can help reduce damage a little bit, but it eats up your fast actions. So you sometimes want to save actions in combat if you go at the start of the initiative order. Um, if you're at the end of the initiative order, then it may not matter. But if you use uh, a fast action before it's your turn, then when it gets around to your turn, that action's already been used. Uh, I guess that's really quick. We could talk about initiative. It's done with a card system, 1 through 10. Uh, every character draws one card. Some talents might let you do something different, but generally you roll, you draw one card and you start initiative at initiative one going up to 10. So getting the low number here is good and the high number is often not great. Uh, many of the alien creatures have a speed value of two or higher. Some even have three. They get to draw one initiative card for every point of speed. And on that initiative, they get to do a full round of actions. So a creature with speed two draws two initiative cards. And at their two initiatives, they get their either one fast and one slow or two fast actions. So... Of course, most aliens don't really have ranged attacks per se, so kind of represent how fast and dangerous they are in the movies. They can get up really quickly, and um, getting into combat with an alien critter is usually terrible. Now, once you take enough damage to drop you to zero health, you are considered broken, 
and what happens here is you're going to roll a critical injury. It's a d66 table. If you're not familiar with that, it means you roll two d6 dice and uh, you basically roll them one at a time. The first dice is going to be the tens column. So either, you know, the teens in the case of a one or a 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And the second dice letting you know what the rest of the number is. So if I roll a one and a three, that's a 13. If I roll a five and a four, that's 54. So there's a bunch of different injuries you can get here. Now, it might not necessarily be realistic because you could potentially get the wind knocked out of you or get your head ripped off on this critical roll. But again, it's a simpler system and uh, it makes combat really dangerous and very intense because when you hit zero health, you know, that guy that punched you may have just punched you so hard that he gave you some serious injury or perhaps even killed you or you've just been stunned for a turn. So want to avoid that if at all possible. Uh, to make matters worse, uh, characters, there are some insta-death results. Basically anything in the 60s is insta-death. Uh, 40s and 50s tend to be injuries of some sort. Some last longer than others. And stuff in the 10s, 20s, and 30s are usually minor or um, just uh, short-term disabilities. But when you get into the 50s and 60s, it's, it's pretty much game over, man. Game over. Uh, to make matters worse, we have alien creatures running around. Uh, anything that's not a human in this game, pretty much, at least what's been released so far. Uh, the cool thing is they, they make it very easy for the GM to run these creatures because rather than deciding, okay, is this alien going to use its tail? Is it going to, you know, use its inner jaw, spit acid, grab somebody, grapple, tackle them? You just roll a dice. You roll a single d6. Every monster, quote unquote, in the game has an attack chart, and that when you roll, that'll determine what action the creature takes. Uh, now, this might seem a little weird or a little um, kind of out there, like there's a little nebulous, but I think it helps reinforce that these are creatures that we just don't have the capability to understand. And so they might do something that in game terms seems a little dumb or worthless, but we don't understand them. Uh, so that's, that's I think, part of why it's done that way. So you roll a d6, generally speaking, uh, lower results, one, two, and three, are minor type of attacks that might knock you down, add stress, make you take a panic roll, although it can be pretty bad depending on what your stress is at. Um, but when you get up to the higher rolls, fours, fives, and sixes, this is where the creature usually is actually attacking you. And some of these, if the attack ends up causing damage, will do specific critical injuries or they will kill you outright. Um, spoilers, if a face hugger rolls a six and manages to hit you, it's latched onto your face and you're toast. Uh, if an alien rolls a six, it's bit, it's bit through your head with its double jaw and you're dead. Um, now, for some players, that can be a big turnoff. I myself have had the very first combat I've entered where I've gotten instant killed by an alien. But that, again, is what this universe is about. And if you listen to Gal's Geist, you know I always encourage embracing character death and the danger of uncertainty. So lean into that, enjoy it, don't worry about it, especially in uh, cinematic play, there'll be some backup characters. Sure, it can suck having your character get killed off right away, but hey, that's the nature of horror movies, and if you're not into horror, then this might not be the game for you. Uh, but I recommend you check it out either way. Uh, so that's a brief, quote-unquote, brief synopsis of the Alien RPG. Uh, I could go into more detail, but suffice to say, there's a good amount of material here. Um, they've gotten the help of Andrew Gaska, who has worked with Fox on a lot of Alien stuff. Um, probably one of the things I would say he's most known for is kind of being the continuity guru of what is canon and what is not. And he talks about how... Uh, they basically have taken uh, all the alien material from everywhere and kind of broke it into three categories of this is canon, this, you know, and then category two is kind of, well, this is uh, mostly canon or you can consider it canon for the most part because there's nothing that really uh, suggests otherwise. And then there's, you know, this stuff is definitely not canon, not related. Sorry, Predator fans. Alien versus Predator is not part of the continuity. However, 
there could be a whole nother universe or a whole nother franchise where it is. And um, I've seen plenty of people make up rules for predators and things like that. I don't think we're ever gonna see that in this RPG system because this is meant to be canon. They have added to and moved up the storyline in some regards. And there's tons of lore. The core rulebook, I cannot stress enough and, and just give praise to. This is the only RPG book that I have ever read that I have legitimately read cover to cover and enjoyed it. Because there are so few rules in this book and the rest is just gorgeous cool artwork and uh just great lore there's a ton of background about the companies the universe different sectors of space different um clusters of systems and planets and the the colonial marines book also really uh, adds to that as well and, and adds to the alien timeline and there is a meta plot in the alien RPG as well Which is pretty cool to see a lot of the cinematics Revolve around that uh, we kind of have like a trilogy right now of chariot of the gods destroyer of worlds and heart of darkness which uh, The PDF is out. It hasn't been released yet, but that's coming soon the colonial Marines book uh, adds into that as well and uh, you know, there's more stuff coming so there's um, there's lots to see, lots to uh, experience, and it's a very easy system to play. It's a very easy system to teach and learn. Uh, I myself have run the Starter Set Adventure and Chariot of the Gods for I can't even tell you how many friends. As a matter of fact, I've, I've lost track and I've lost count to the point where it's hard to find more people to run it for because I've asked all my friends to play it. So... Um, check it out i've run it for gen con as well and for brand new groups of people and within 10 20 minutes i can teach the rules and we can be off playing and those have been some of the best sessions so uh check that out because um gen con online is coming up well at the time you hear this this is gonna be july 1st so uh next month basically a month from now is Gen Con, and I think if it hasn't gone live at this point, it probably is very soon. The online catalog, events catalog, will be up, and I'll be running a whole bunch of alien stuff again. I did it last year, it was a blast. Can't wait to do it again. So, if you want to give that a try, uh, check me out, uh, Dragon's Creed Gaming, on, uh, on Gen Con Online, or uh, if you and your friends want to give the Alien RPG a little dab and a little try, get your feet wet, check me out on uh, Start Playing. The Great Unclean One is my profile. And uh, if you'd like to hire me to run your, your group through a game or two and get a taste of this absolutely incredible uh, system, step away from D&D &D and try something really fucking cool and really new and really awesome, uh, Drop me a line and give me a shout out. I'll, I'll guarantee you will not be disappointed. So with that in mind, let's close this out. So what to expect from Dragon's Greed and Alien? Well, uh, you are going to hear about maybe 12 or so recordings we have. Uh, some of these, I will warn you, are our very first recordings. Things we recorded even before we started playing Gallows Geist. When the COVID outbreak started, I had just gotten my hands on the Alien book. I was chomping at the bit, and I ran our original crew, that's Brian, Matt, Tyler, and Will, uh, through the Starter Set Adventure, uh, Hope's Last Day, and then I ran them through the first cinematic, which was available at the time, Chariot of the Gods. And those first episodes, especially Hope's Last Day, I will warn you, very rough. Our recording is all over the place. I'm clearing my throat constantly. I apologize for that. I was kind of nervous, um, but I've come a long way. But I figured, why let content go to waste? If you don't want to listen to it, that's fine. I totally get it. It was a little cringe for me to listen to in some regards, but... Um, clean it up as best I can. We've added some cool, creepy background music. Uh, Chariot of the Gods, though, far better. Um, night and day difference, really, as we, we move into things. And 
just seeing how that adventure turns out. I've run it so many times, and every time there's a crazy different twist. So check that out. That's what we got coming next. Uh, I did Hopes Last Day with another group. You'll see some other returning faces and some new faces as well. And then we go into Destroyer of Worlds, which is the second cinematic RP uh, system, or c cinematic adventure, where the group plays as a group of colonial marines. And that kind of continues the quote-unquote trilogy of the meta plot started in Chariot of the Gods, kind of loosely tied to it. Um, that we did last year around Halloween, so that is far more recent. I guess <laughs> it's almost been a year, but as far as how far we've come with Dragon's Greed, it's a lot more recent and a lot n more nicely done. I've got my actual recording equipment. I'm not in the corner of my basement um, you know, with my uh, my Microsoft Surface and my cheap headset, I've actually got some gear and tools there, so the quality is much, much better. Uh, but either way, check it out. If you like horror, if you like sci-fi, or you want to try something new and different, give us a listen. Tell us what you think. And then after, uh, at the end of that, check out our last uh, episode. It's a very special recording we're calling Return to Hadley's Hope. Uh, this is a homebrew mission that I put together for a group of friends. They play as a group of colonial marines, and it's kind of a what-if scenario. Uh, what if a different group of marines were sent to Hadley's Hope before Ripley and her uh, group of marines were sent in? So it takes place slightly before Aliens, the second film, and it's a little bit of a twist on uh, what's been presented in the RPG and what happened in the movies. So check that out, because that I am referring to as a full audio drama adventure. Uh, I went through and added sound effects for that episode, and while it was a big pain in the ass, uh, it turned out to be really cool in the end. I think you guys are really going to dig that. So that's how we're going to close up Alien for now. Don't worry, we'll be coming back to Alien. I I love this game. There's no, there's no doubting that. So... Um, we'll be coming back to Alien at some point, maybe with the Colonial Marines campaign or my own campaign, we'll see. But check it out, it's awesome, that's what's coming up for the next couple uh, weeks here. And then um, be sure to join us in October, Orktober, that's right, you've heard us talking about it on Gallows Geist. We are going to be playing Warhammer 40,000 Wrath and Glory. We're doing an all-orc greenskin campaign, and that is going to air the first week of October, the first Friday. So stay tuned for Alien, stay tuned for that. we got a lot of sci-fi craziness coming up, and then we'll see what the future holds. I can't quite give all the details yet, but I did mention this in our Gallows Guys finale. I have a very, very cool special collaboration coming up with some very exciting people. All I can tell you is that it's going to be about Alien, and it's going to be fucking awesome. You'll be hearing about that probably next month in August. We'll give you the details. So stay tuned. Dragon's Greed is not going anywhere. We've got a ton more content for you folks. And I think that's about it. So uh, again, we're Dragon's Greed Gaming. I'm your host and GM, the Great Unclean One. Uh, check us out on Facebook for all of our latest news. Follow us there or on Spreaker and our YouTube channel where we put out videos of our... Uh, uh, our recordings as well and join us every friday for a new episode starting well today uh we've got our first episode of the first playthrough of hope's last day and every friday uh from here on out we've got a new episode dropping at around 7 30 in the morning central time central in the u.s and uh last but not least if you've been listening to us you know our patreon just went live uh this month uh however if you are unfamiliar with that, if you'd like to help support the channel, if you like what we've done, if you want to help us out along the way, toss a couple coins in the Dragon's Horde, as we say. Check us out at Patreon slash DragonsGreedGaming.com. We have four different tiers of rewards that you can back us at, um, from about, I think, starting at $2 up to 20 bucks a month, something like that. Uh, check it out. There might be something there you like, early access to episodes, one-on-one uh, -on -one chats with me or other cast members, um, art from our good friend Kyle, 
Um, we've got a special monthly Patreon-only Warhammer campaign going on called Tales from the Old World with a new group of characters uh, exploring the Warhammer world in the same continuity as Gallows Geist. We're going to see some other NPCs that we have encountered and go through some of the fallout from some of the Geist actions as well. Uh, so check that out. we got a lot of cool stuff going on. And uh, again, if you can't support us there, I get it. I understand. Gas is, you know, $1,000, uh, anywhere you go. Way too damn expensive. So if you can't toss a coin in the Dragon's Horde, then just give us a like or a follow or leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes and help us grow. I'm counting on you, America. you got to catch up to our friends over across the pond Denmark, Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, all throughout Europe, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the UK. Um, we're always up in there, like top 200, top 100, uh, or even, even top 50. So, America, I need you to catch up on that, all right? So, Canada too, I didn't forget you. Love you guys. Uh, so thanks, guys. I uh, hope this uh, gives you a little introduction to what we're going to do here on the channel next. I hope you enjoy the alien stuff. We got more coming. Thanks again. Love you all. Love the support. We really appreciate it. We wouldn't be doing this without you. And uh, you make all the extra work in my life worth it. I love it. I can't wait to bring you guys more stuff. And this has been The Great Unclean One, signing off.